So welcome everyone to uh, our webinar, uh, Building Your Online Presence with, with Instagram, hosted by Nadia Russo. Um, uh, Nadia Russo is the founder of Afternoon Media, a digital marketing agency located now in Nevada. Um, I'll let her explain more about the business. I'll just explain that, uh, I'll just uh, introduce myself and the context. Nadia, I know Nadia for the past year, and I've been working with her as a pro seller on Fiverr uh, because I'm her customer success manager. Um, Nadia is a fantastic uh, pro seller, very engaged in social media marketing, content marketing, marketing strategy, and public relations. And she's your go-to uh, person if you're looking for any of those services. So without further ado, I want to introduce Nadia. So Nadia, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much for that warm intro, Ran. And thank you, Marcy, for getting this all set up. I'm super excited to speak with you all today about Instagram and how to use Instagram to grow your business. Hence the title, Building Your Online Presence with Instagram. We're going to talk about the three-step system to successfully grow your business on this platform that for so many causes a lot of excitement, but sometimes a little bit of frustration. But before we get into all of that, you might want to know, why should you even listen to me? Now, obviously, Rand really pumped me up there, so I appreciate it. But I have been in the world of social media for quite some time. In fact, I've been doing social media marketing all the way back since 2012, when I had um, two interviewees. I was working moonlighting as a freelance writer at that time ask for help for their Twitter, actually. So at that time, I didn't really think social media was a thing, but fast forward to now, and I'm the CEO and founder of Alternate Media, which is a full service global marketing agency. So we do specialize in influencer marketing, social media marketing, and PR. On the influencer side of things, we also represent influencers in contracts. So essentially we will pitch these influencers for brand collaborations and pair them with brands that come to us for influencer campaigns. And on social media front, we do Instagram marketing, Twitter, the whole nine, but definitely my favorite area of social media is Instagram. As a result of my best-selling service on Fiverr Pro, Instagram Rockstar. So I launched Instagram Rockstar at the end of 2017. So Fiverr Pro, um, Rand, I'm not sure if I'm getting this wrong, but I'm pretty sure Pro rolled out around that same year, maybe a few months before I was approved and I came on board and I launched my Instagram service, Instagram Rockstar. And at that time, I realized that a lot of people were struggling with this platform for more reasons than just they didn't know what to post, they didn't know what hashtags to use. It always came down to they don't know how to really align all of these different pieces with what they want to achieve as a brand or a business. So I was like, I think I can solve this problem for people with this service. So in many ways, Instagram Rockstar is what I call a productized service, a service that follows a repeatable formula that can be customized to every single customer that comes my way. And I've had the privilege and the honor of supporting over 250 customers worldwide with Instagram Rockstar. And the three key steps that we follow, those three key areas that are repeatable, that will not change, that we're gonna talk about today, are strategy, content, and engagement. But before I move forward, I would love to hear from you, you know, how comfortable are you on Instagram? Drop a one if you feel like, pretty comfortable on Instagram, but you just need a little bit more support and drop a two if Instagram is driving you crazy, but you know that you have to move forward with it and you know you need the help. So I'm seeing a lot of, <laughs> I'm seeing a zero. Don't be so hard on yourself, okay? I know you can at least give yourself a 0 0.5. So lots of ones. Oh, a three. That's very, hmm, a little abstract here. Let's see, lots and lots and lots of Two, we have some twos. The question again was drop a one if you are feeling, you know, mostly comfortable with Instagram and you just really want a boost. Maybe you are posting, but you don't feel like you're optimizing as much as you could. And a two, if you feel like, as you just don't know what the heck to do. Instagram is driving you absolutely crazy. 
but you know that you need it. You know that people are on it. Oh, two, 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 two. All right, two and a half, one and two. Honestly, no clue. <laughs> I love you guys. You're honestly like starting my day off so right. So, you know, for the twos, and I probably actually should have added a three. I'm gonna add a three actually. The three, if you are a three, you are somebody that maybe you just don't understand why Instagram at all. So maybe you don't understand the point of getting on this platform. You think it's for young people only. And I won't even, I mean, this is just Instagram. Like if, can you imagine if I was doing a TikTok presentation, like people are so like, what in the world? I mean, for in the beginning, I myself was a little baffled by TikTok, to be honest. But you know, Instagram has a lot of foot traffic. Instagram has over 1 billion users. That's a lot of people. And obviously Facebook, which I like to say <laughs> is the, the mother, the now the mommy, the holder of Instagram since it assumed um, the platform is in many ways in the last year or so, it has influenced some of the the dynamics and the changes of the platform. But because there are so many people there, that's a huge chunk of traffic that could potentially be pushed to your brand and your business so you can grow. Okay, someone says, I see, yeah. Whoa, two, I have to read this one, this is awesome. Two plus three equals five, I'm confused about the processes. Okay, well, I feel you, my friend. So and the algorithm and the way it works on Instagram, it, not when you have all these people, you also have a great opportunity to be found, but only if you're using it the right way. And this is probably one of the biggest points of frustration for people. And another thing, 80% of Instagram users are actually outside of the United States, which is really cool. If you're trying, if you are in the States and you want to diversify into other markets, say you are a fashion brand and you're based in the Midwest, but you've noticed you've gotten a decent number of likes from people who are in Melbourne, Australia. Like what? Like that's unusual. Well, maybe that's something you should lean in on just because you're in the United States um, and you have your logistics set up to potentially work with this foreign market. Why not lean in on that? There, this is a wor the world we're in right now. And this is, I think, particularly pronounced by the times that we're living in currently. It is a global world. And when on, you're on a platform like Instagram, you really have the opportunity to engage with people from other places. But of course, you want to do so strategically, you know? So I have another question for you all. Um, going back to this last slide, so I'm gonna backtrack really quick. If you are a, regardless of where you are, would you like to be considered a global brand? If you would like to be considered a global brand, drop a five. If you're happy just being local, being regional only, then don't write anything. See, I think most of us would love the idea of being a global brand. When I tell people that Alternative Media is a global purpose forward marketing agency, that kind of gets people like, like oh, you're global. You have a global footprint. Technically, my business is um, headquartered in Los Angeles. I reside in Las Vegas, but we are a global business. Canadian millennials. Well, we'll talk about niching, don't you worry. So cycling back to my first question, obviously there is a lot of mystique around Instagram. I think a lot of people get stressed out about it. They often say, I wanna reach new customers, but I have no idea what to post. I get a lot of, every single day I get probably, I wanna say like 60% of the inquiries I get on Fiber Pro relate to Instagram. Um, and a lot of the time those questions are like, you know, I'm stuck at a certain following number or I am doing X, Y, or Z, but I just don't know how to post about that. And you know what's interesting? In my time working with this platform, having Instagram Rockstar the service, I have worked with nearly every niche imaginable from the most mainstream, you know, like your standard tech startups, apps, um, professional entities like law firms and doctor's offices, all the way to as niche as you can go. I think I had somebody once who was a self-described vampire psychic witch residing in Reno or something. I'm like, huh, okay. Bring it on. I'm curious. How is that going to go? <laughs> so, you know, 
obviously what you post is going to be somewhat dependent on not only what you do and who you are, but what your audience wants to see. And there is a formula to that and we're going to get into it. And yes, the hashtag question. Drop a seven if hashtags drive you out of your mind and you don't understand what they're for and why you just like, why these hashtags, who cares? <laughs> getting a lot of sevens, but you guys, not all is lost. I'm telling you, there is a solution to all of this and it is not as complicated as it seems. I think when you're on a platform like Instagram that has so much going on, you know, you have IGTV, you have IGTV stories, you have your feed, and now you have analytics, likes are suddenly hidden from people. I mean, there's a lot going on. So when you have all that going on and you're thinking about your own business and you're like, okay, well, I need to make money, but how am I going to have time to master all of this? What do I do first? That's where that confusion and what I like to call um, operation paralysis sets in. And that's when like you're thinking about all of the different things that you have to do. You almost freeze up. You're like, you know what, maybe I should just not do anything. But that is not the point of today. We're gonna to get into a formula that is very straightforward. So at the end of all of this, you can take action, okay? So that's it, the three-step system. To success on Instagram is really, really simple. And that's strategy, content, and engagement. A strategy is probably your, it's your, mo it's your weapon for success and not just for Instagram. Um, my company, we actually develop full marketing strategies as well. So that's when we go into like a whole host of different marketing activities that will connect with your business objectives. But we're just talking about Instagram right now. So, but regardless, you really need a strategy for anything. It is your roadmap, it's your blueprint, it's your foundation, however you want to look at it. And so the strategy, it's going to essentially break down everything that you need to do, particularly as it relates to content and engagement. So that's where your hashtags are going to come in. So you can achieve your business objectives. Now, before you even get started with developing your strategy, of course, you're going to need to know what in the world your business objectives actually are. So if you haven't taken time to really, you know, reflect on the key three things that you want to achieve in your business or for your brand, because even if you don't have technically a separation at this point between yourself and um, a business entity, maybe you're a freelancer, maybe you self-describe a solopreneur, maybe you're an entertainer, you yourself are a business. So you need to take a step back and think about what are the top three things I want to achieve. I will give you a hint. Typically in any business situation, there's going to always be two overarching goals. Now you need to dial in a little bit more, but the two overarching goals will always be brand related, so brand positioning related, and conversion. Um, conversion that typically will translate to revenue, but it can also translate to other things as well. So in short, I'm going to read this here. Without great content on a platform as aesthetically driven as Instagram, so the content's going to be broken down in your strategy, you're essentially on a pathway to no man's land and going through the motions. You, and if you don't have any engagement, so imagine I get this a lot. A lot of people, they default to buying fake followers. This is a gigantic no. Do not do it. Do not buy fake followers. This is my PSA for you right now. Don't do it. Because those people, or non-people rather, they're not going to engage with you. So even say you're taking a lot of time to make gorgeous posts and you bought 10,000 fake followers, those things, they're not going to engage. You're not going to make any money. You're just wasting your time. You have what you have at that point is a vanity plate not a tool to leverage to help you grow your business. And that's ultimately what Instagram or any social media channel is. It is a tool to help you grow your business. Now, of course, there's tools that you can use on Instagram or related to Instagram to be successful there. But sometimes I think we, we overthink the whole process. So that's a way to simplify it in your mind. Because a lot of this does come down to mindset, but this is not a mindset conversation. But you will find me kind of dipping into that a little bit because without it, you're not gonna be able to take that action you need to do. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, and this is an older picture of myself. I think I was, I was working with a friend who had this random modeling shoot and I'm like, oh, okay, I'll do it. I used to do modeling and acting back in the day, way back in the day before I segued into writing and marketing and all that jazz. But 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about what I have achieved on Instagram myself, just to give you additional information and insight as to why it matters and why it's really, really cool when you're doing it right. So I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I want to say maybe, gosh, time flies. Like two and a half years ago, um, I had a message slide into my DM. And at this point, I probably had maybe half the following I have now. Maybe I had around 10 or 12,000 followers. I didn't have over 20,000 like I have today. Um, and someone messaged me and they're like, hey, you know, I would really like for you to um, look into this project I'm doing. And the project was involved with, essentially it was raising awareness around the homelessness epidemic taking place primarily in New York and LA, which I'm very much an activist and passionate about these issues. So I was like, of course, I would love to learn about that. So essentially, I got involved with this project, which is called the Nylon Project, which then led to my getting involved with this big fashion convention called Fashion Innovation in New York, where eventually I became a marketing partner for this. And this takes place every New York Fashion Week. And then I ended up sitting on a panel for that. And then I also met the founders of Honeysuckle Magazine, and as a result, became a columnist and a partner in this magazine, which is distributed throughout Barnes and Noble in the entire United States. I still moonlight in my writing stuff. I actually recently interviewed Ricky Lake of 90s talk show fame for Honeysuckle Magazine. So long story short on that one, I would not have had the opportunity to be a columnist, interview Ricky Lake, do this fashion innovation convention, do any of these other things. If I hadn't gotten that message that said, your profile really stood out to me, I can tell that you care about making a difference. Would you consider getting involved with this? So that just shows right there that when your brand positioning is right, when your content is right, it's speaking to what you want to do and who you're trying to reach, great things can happen on this platform. So I already touched on, obviously, I've supported over 250 plus global customers and clients that catapulted my agency to now multiple six figures. Now, clearly I have a good service and I'm working you know, a big part of the success I do attribute to, um, you know, my brand awareness on the Fiverr Pro platform. But if I didn't, do you think that people would want to work with me if I only had 500 followers on Instagram? No, I don't think they would trust me because I'm, you know, over here talking about Instagram success. I can't have 500 followers and I have to have content that aligns with who I am and what I'm trying to do, right? Now, I mentioned earlier my influencer division of my agency. I've worked with a lot of prominent influencers across verticals. One of them here is Nick Mora. She's a red carpet host in Hollywood, and she's signed to our agency board. So in terms of a strategy, it really is your blueprint and how you will win with your content and your engagement. It's also it's like a security blanket because you can always fall back on that and review it and refer to it to be sure that you have that foundation to move forward with. So I talked a little bit about business goals. So someone asked, what is a cross vertical? So a cross vertical is different sectors of the market. So for example, tech would be a one tech vertical, fashion, e-com, so on and so forth. Small business, um, it kind of, it goes on and on. So that's what that means. Just wanted to answer that question for a participant there. So. Going back to the business objectives, is, you know, when you're doing your strategy, you really have to understand that if you don't know what you want to achieve in your business, you, you really have to take a step back and think about that before you move forward. Okay, so you need to be able to break down the three key areas that you will focus in on now. So obviously two of them here, the big two are content and engagement. And at the very end, your strategy is going to need to have an action plan. So I want to talk, you know, going back to strategy, we worked with this really great artist named Miranda Wright. She is a hip hop artist out of New York. Go give her a follow. She's amazing. We also secured a high profile partnership for her um, with a nonprofit called the Chill Foundation, which does a lot of work um, with underserved youth to get them empowered through board sports. And Miranda, in addition to being a hip hop artist, she's also um, a snowboarder. So it was really important to her when she came to us to do something that would increase her brand positioning as a snowboarder and hip hop artist. 
but also she wanted to give back. So I told her about our purposeful partnership and how we could pair her with the Chill Foundation. So, I mean, that was one of her objectives. And, you know, as we were moving forward, she was like, you know, obviously I need to grow my following on Instagram. Like, yes, you do. But, you know, she didn't really know how to go about it. So we were like, okay, you know, we're going to really dial in on this brand positioning of yours that really makes you known as this hip hop artist who also is a snowboarder. And we decided to dial in on these three key objectives. And that was to raise funds for the Chill Foundation, attract a high level collaborator for her music video, and grow the fault her Instagram following by another 2000 from 12,500. And so this was like, these were more like three month to three, I want to say more like three month goals, I believe. So we're like, okay, we're going to dial in on this. And so I want you to remember when you're setting your business objectives and the stuff you're going to be doing on Instagram, I don't want you to just make goals that only connect to Instagram. Like I want to have like, you know, 25 likes a post that, you know, like you, you, I want you to think about your business. Remember, you're going to be using Instagram and creating content on Instagram to help you achieve these goals. But, you know, you should have one goal related to following for an Instagram strategy. So the results were is that we um, got two of, out of three of these goals achieved, actually not just achieved, but exceeded. We raised over 1000 and we grew her following to about close to 16K, which was awesome. So we really, really made great things happen. And she felt really good because she made a difference. She raised funds for this organization that also in turn has helped her, you know, now she's since performed at um, the, the Burton Open, which was like, wow. So she's been collaborating with Burton, which the Burton founders are actually the founders of the Chill Foundation. So my second example, um, I worked with this really interesting guy who is a copywriter and an entrepreneur called the Father Freedom. He came um, to me late last year, I want to say mid last year, actually, June 2019. He was really frustrated about the lack of engagement <clears throat> on his Instagram feed. He didn't have time to post regularly, which a big issue with Instagram is the time. So I'm going to talk about some tools at the end that will help you stay efficient. And he realized his audience size did not quite match his authority as a revered copywriter and entrepreneur. So his first goal was to grow to 15,000 to 20,000 in six months. His second goal was to continue building and growing his um, multitude of brands. So he was like, I really want to grow to this amount, but through this process, I need to have like, you know, more traffic going, right? So the results were he had growth in over 3,500 in two months to approximately 16,000 followers from 12,500 and a 100% increase in engagement. It does not hurt that he has some of the best content to work with. So that was awesome. So you're probably wondering how in the world does this all work here? So first of all, you need fantastic content. And if you don't have a clear handle for your brand, I do suggest going back to the drawing board. So when I say clear handle on your brand, you know, obviously you need to know who you are and what you stand for. What does your business do? Um, what is your brand positioning? Think about these things and then think about your key objectives. Now that's done, then you can start moving into the type of content that you're going to create. So Instagram being a very aesthetic based platform, it really does reward people for posting amazing content. That's how you ultimately end up in what's known as the explore page, which is essentially an aggregated um, area of posts that were engaging really well. So there's a lot going on on Instagram as we discussed. That's why a lot of folks find themselves overwhelmed. Um, you know, I'm not even going to get into too much about Instagram live right now, but I want you to primarily focus on your Instagram feed and that's where you're going to upload all of your actual posts. I do suggest minimally once a day, but ideally if you can post twice a day, that's going to be optimal. Your Instagram stories. So Instagram stories is like when you log on to your Instagram and you see those little circles. Those are Instagram stories. Now I'm not talking about the highlights, the highlight reel that people can use to essentially, 
memorialize their Instagram stories, but the stories that like, when you're going into your profile, there's a little plus sign, you can go press on that and you can make a story. Now, what I've done to suggest is that with your Instagram feed, that's where I recommend having a little bit more planning going on. And when you're writing out your strategy, you know, you can take some time to actually break down, you know, this is the types of posts I'm going to be making. With stories, I recommend taking more of a, what I like to call a documentarian approach, kind of. A lot of, some person that does this really well is Gary V. He is very much, his stories are very much documentarian style. So that break down, it kind of like, you know, creates a nice juxtaposition between the two because your stories are more free flowing, more behind the scenes, whereas your feed is a bit more curated. Now with IGTV, this is where you can upload long form content. I've been actually having conversations with people about creating regular web series to engage their audiences or, you know, short interviews, like five minute interviews. There's so much you can do. And I think, you know, like I mentioned earlier, when you start re overthinking the whole process, that's where it gets a little overwhelming. So I wanna talk about the power of threes. So when you're structuring your content, follow the power of threes. That's structuring your content between promotional, educational, and motivational content. Promotional, educational, and motivational content. This is going to give you some framework in how you develop your content. For example, if you're making one post, start with educational. The next day you can do promotional. The next day you can do motivational and keeping this flow going. So it's gonna add a nice process to your, um, to your work. So motivational content, the purpose it serves is to strike an emotional connection in your audience. Now, a lot of the times when people think about an emotional connection, they think automatically sad. Oh, I had somebody I was working with and they were like, I don't know how I could possibly do motivational content because I'm just not somebody that is a very sensitive person. So, I mean, that seems cheesy. And I was like, I have a question for you. Do you get excited? Do you get angry? Do you get, you know, naming a whole list of different types of emotions? As long as you are eliciting one of those in your audience with a post through a dynamic image and caption, then you are eliciting an emotional mode reaction in your audience. And so therefore that's why I tend to classify as motivational or emotional content. And, you know, again, this does not have to be cheesy. You just want to have, be able to elicit a reaction. Typically I recommend that particularly if you are a freelancer or you're a solopreneur, or even if you do have your own business separate from yourself, it's really important to have your own personal journey well, interwoven throughout your feed because that's what people are going to respond to. They want to know how you were, got to where you are right now, but also you want to take them on, you want to take the customer themselves on that journey. How are they, how is what you're offering? How is your product or service going to take them from point A to point B? And, you know, thinking about the emotions that they're going to feel as a result. What positive outcome are they going to enjoy as a result? Educational content serves to strike an intellectual connection in your audience. So that's informative content. That's essentially the what and the how of how your product or service works or how you work. You know, if you are, say you're a copywriter and you know, you want to be very clear as to how what you're offering and your approach to copywriting is different than your competition. So it's helpful to take your potential customer on a process of learning about how you're different. You could do this a whole number of different ways. You could just, you could make a post of yourself and have a caption that breaks down like, you know, your own journey and how you're decided to make your process different and distinct. That's one way. Another way is having a very simple graphic design quote that just breaks down maybe in three different ways, maybe three points of advice that connect to your perspective of copywriting. And promotional content serves to lead your audience to a specific action. So that's call to action. Now, essentially your promotional content will typically begin as either motivational, striking an emotional connection in your audience or intellectual, striking um, you know, that intellectual chord. So educational content. 
And what's distinct about this promotional content is that you're going to end in some sort of call to action. So at the very end, you're going to be like, you know, purchase today, click the link in the bio, send me a direct message, purchase um, by going here. This, you need to have a clear call to action. And the reason you don't want every single post to be promotional is because you're going to cause what I like to call potential buyer fatigue. You don't want to tire out your potential audience. And when we work with a lot of our influencers, sometimes they get really excited to engage with different brands and do brand collaborations. So they might start doing day in, day out promotional posts, like check out this lipstick and this is a contest and this and that. You don't want every post to be promotional. You are going to cause a lot of fatigue in your audience. So I would like to hear from you all. Um, drop in eight if you have found yourself getting tired out by people that do too much promotional content. Maybe you're coming across an Instagram and you're like, every single post is click the link, click the link, click the link, click the link, buy today, buy today. It's very, I hate to say this, but it is, it's a little antiquated. People are more sophisticated now. They like stories and you can tell stories in a way that's motivational and engaging, but you still, you don't want every single pose to end in that call to action because you are going to create fatigue in your audience. It's not wise. So I just want to give an example of how I, I saw a lot of eights, by the way. Um, I myself, like, I wasn't always so great on Instagram, you guys, like, <laughs> in fact, I mean, I wasn't. So this is a post I made in 2016. I was talking, I was sharing, I guess in many ways, this was a promotional post. I was sharing a piece that I did, um, on a woman who, she's a poet. She actually got famous through creating her, um, poetry via tweets on Twitter. It was pretty cool. And I went out and I interviewed her. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to make a post promoting this. And so if you notice, I just have a bunch of hashtags, but I didn't even tag her in the post. And my article, instead of having the article and the link in the bio, which I just dropped it here. If you're doing the promotion, always keep your link in your bio. I always suggest getting a link tree at this point because you can house a lot of different links there, which is really helpful. So I'm going to show you a newer post. So this is a newer post. And the reason I'm using my content is because I think it's easier to turn, you know, cast a critical eye on myself than on somebody else. So I wanted to show you how I was not always so good at Instagram. And this is a really nerdy picture, but um, I made a post last year where I was talking about the Barnes and Noble um, situation with Honeysuckle Magazine, the one that this whole situation is a result of an Instagram DM. It all comes back to Instagram. But the reason why this is a better post is because I'm tagging people. Um, you know, I actually have a little bit of a story here. So it's not like just hashtags. Don't ever just do hashtags. Now that we're talking about hashtags, this is what we discuss as being a big, big point of confusion for a lot of folks. And you need really good hashtags that are dialed in on who you are and who you want to reach to be successful. And what I suggest, particularly when you're starting out, is you want to use at least 20 hashtags, but also aim for hashtags with a range of 10,000 to 500,000 use cases. So when I say that, that's basically what I'm saying is don't use hashtags that are exclusively like very overused, like hashtag POTD, for example, that's hashtag the post of the day. It's very overused. But if you use a hashtag that's not quite as overused, you have a greater chance of being found by your target audience. Because hashtags, in short, all they are are search terms. Hashtags are like search engine terms for Instagram, you guys. So you just wanna make sure that you are dialing in on the right ones. So we're gonna talk about how to do that. So when you select your hashtags, I recommend that you have this ratio going on. You want the majority, about 60% actually, to be audience specific. So when I say audience specific, I am talking about using hashtags that not only your audience would be using to self identify, but hashtags that they would be searching for as well. Now your brand, those are hashtags that are dialed in on your brand, your specific brand name, 
and maybe a couple of other aspects that relate to your brand and where you are, perhaps your location. Um, and another aspect, your industry specific hashtags, so 20% brand specific, 20% industry specific. Industry specific is the industry that you are in. So if you are a makeup artist, for example, um, say you're a makeup artist living in Las Vegas, you are going to want to do some industry specific hashtags, ideally. Your audience specific hashtags would probably be a lot of people that would be looking for a makeup artist in Las Vegas. Now, of course, right now, given the time that we're in, a lot of this stuff is on hiatus, but regardless, it's still a great time to start forging those relationships virtually that can later be taken off the internet. So I'm gonna show you an example of a post here that um, was following the previous hashtag formula. And I'm sorry, it's not quite as big as I wanted it to be. But this is a platform that works with influencers and brands to host online experiences. It's a very short caption, but it's clever and it's short. And as you can see, like the first two hashtags are very brand specific because the brand name is Groupado and then the whole, the handle name is Go Groupado. The brand connects to experiences and event experiences. And then we were thinking about targeting the influencers because a lot in purposeful brands, because a lot of the people that we found that were very interested were brands that identify as being impact focused or influencers that we're really on the ground um, wanting to make a difference with their work and host an experience around that. So how about engaging on other people's profiles though, using hashtags? <laughs> this is like, I think this is where people get the most confused and they're most like overwhelmed because it seems like a lot of time to be potentially spent on Instagram. But let's go back to that Las Vegas makeup artist example. So there's about 100, close to 165,000 posts for this hashtag, hashtag Las Vegas MUA, which is an acronym for makeup artist. And so, you know, you want to see what's going on on this. Say, okay, I am a Las Vegas makeup artist and I want to see what's happening with this hashtag. Well, there's about 165,000 posts under this hashtag. So if I'm going to tap in on this hashtag, I want to engage with other people who are makeup artists, but I also want to find people who like watching this, these makeup artists because quite possibly they are models, they are dancers, they are performers that need makeup. So you want to identify an industry or audience related hashtag in your hashtag bank in your strategy. So going back to the strategy, when you're creating your strategy, you ideally should Kind of do a brain dump if you will after you've done some research of a i would suggest around 50 or so hashtags that you can then pull from and extract from as you move forward as you move forward with your engagement and as you move forward with creating your posts and so when you're going to type in a hashtag for research i want you to look at the top and the recent posts so the top posts are always coming up at the top and then you can see also what was posted most recently under that hashtag and so then I want you to find content that resonates with you and I want you to like and comment on it in a non-generic way. So when I say that, unfortunately, a lot of the times, maybe a year or two ago, it was really popular for people to use bot automation and they were essentially messing up, messing completely with the Instagram algorithm and they were automating the process way too much. So they were removing the opportunity to more genuinely interact with a potential with somebody they could connect with when you're building a following on instagram you are essentially building a building relationships at scale so i don't want you to discount somebody that you see just thinking of them as a potential follower if you can start thinking of your as you're growing your following thinking of them as potential customers it's going to very much change your mindset and approach so likewise when you're doing the engagement on the hashtag, you find the hashtag in the search and then you start looking at different posts and you want to engage and you want to, you know, maybe like or leave a comment that says something like, you know, I really like your content or leave another comment saying like, hey, like, how long have you been in Las Vegas, for example, or leave another comment like, um, you know, I love your work. It would be great to connect. Now, again, 
you know, you want to see people that if you are a makeup artist yourself and you're looking at that hashtag, you want to think like, okay, some of the people using that hashtag might also be makeup artists, but some of them might be people looking for that makeup artist. So just be aware and understand this is not a process as you're beginning that you need to rush. We're all on a rush to get from point zero to point 100. We need to stop being on a rush and understand there's a process to be followed to get there. And so just as you can do that process with a hashtag, you can also do that process by identifying what I'd like to recommend a nano or micro influencer that is aligned with your brand. So this is a local makeup artist. She has around 5,300 followers, which would put her more in nano influencer land. But the advantage of finding someone to look at their following after you've engaged with them, maybe followed them, reached out to them, is to see that the following is probably going to be very local. And let's say you are somebody that is trying to keep it local at first. Now, remember I said I want you to expand, but it's usually ideal to start local and then expand. Or if you're going to start global right away, think about doing, say you're, let's say you're a video creator, content creator living in London, and you want to engage with people in Sydney, Australia, New York, New York, and London. So just like I typed hashtag Las Vegas MUA, you probably would do something for hashtag London MUA or hashtag, you know, if you're a video creator, hashtag London creator, hashtag, um, you know, New York, like, or New York blogger, you know, you want to play and look at the types of content that comes up under these hashtags. Just like when you're doing a Google search and you're looking for something that is going to be engaging or interesting for you, you're going to be doing the same thing in Instagram search with these hashtags and with these micro and nano influencers. Now, once you figure out, all right, like I have about three hashtags, about three nano micro influencers, this makes sense. And you can start kind of like developing a system. But what I do ask you is that you don't, if you are liking and commenting, don't do more than 15 of this activity. I um, really err on like the side of caution here. You could probably do a little bit more, especially because I'm asking you to keep it organic and keep it unique and not mass follow, do not ever mass follow, mass and follow people. That is a horrendous tactic. You need to do organic tactical engagement. That's what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about identifying hashtags that align, that connect with who you are and who you're trying to reach, where you are, where the people are that you're trying to reach, nano and micro influencers, so smaller influencers of, um, that your potential audience would be following and engaging that way. And once you nail down these three things, which is going to take you some time, you know, obviously we're just spending a little less than an hour here discussing this. There's this not, it's not gonna be possible for you to master this right away, but at least you have some insight and some understanding of the process that needs to be followed here. Strategy, content, and engagement. So you're probably wondering, well, this sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> what if I don't get it right the first time? What if I waste all this time? Oh my goodness. Like Instagram is still like this great big world out there. I'm like, oh my gosh, what do I do? You need to take a step back and you need to take time to engage this process. That's what you need to do. And when you do that, when you put in the work, you will have success. But nothing successful comes without hard work. So as you're doing this, there are some tools for your Insta toolbox that I would like you to consider. And here they are here. So Canva, probably most of you know about Canva. It is a platform that will help you design um, like nice little images. It'll also help you access some um, very good stock imagery. Say you're a business and you don't have product shots yet. And you know, we're all kind of sequestered to our home. So it might be hard to go out and work with people to do um, photo shoots with them. So you can start looking at potentially using a little bit of stock imagery. I wouldn't use too much if you can't avoid it, but um, you will be able to find some stuff that works for you in the beginning. Planix.com and Influence.co are two platforms that essentially consolidate a bunch of different influencers in one place. 
I mentioned looking out for nano and micro influencers. So you can do that on Instagram directly, but you can also do that on these two platforms. You can commence a free search on influence.co, so you won't even have to pay anything. For Buffer and Planoly are fantastic for scheduling your content. Now, if you are here as an agency owner or a social media manager, and you have several clients that you're working with, I suggest using Buffer because Planoly will drive you crazy if you're only, you know, otherwise, if you're one person, you're one business, Planoly is good. It's very effective. But if you have a lot, maybe even have several companies or in your personal account, I suggest using Buffer. It's just a little bit easier to manage, but everybody's a bit different in their comfort level and what works for them and what doesn't. The repost app, you can find that in, um, I'm pretty sure it's available for Google Play and um, iPhone, but I know for sure it's available for iPhone. And if you ever come across content out there that is really interesting to you and you want to, say you see like an influencer that has made a post or another brand that you think you could see yourself connecting with and working with them, you can repost their content very easily. And now Google Docs. Google Docs, simply Google Drive, very, very effective for organizing your content, creating your plans, having a folder to keep everything organized and systemized, highly recommend it. So I want to ask you, are you ready to kickstart your goals? Obviously, you know, again, like there's a lot to take in here, but ultimately if you can dial in on at least three of your key business objectives, and start thinking strategically about the motivational, educational, and promotional content that you can create and stick to that formula and get, you know, spend even just an hour a day to start doing this hashtag research and activity and engagements in the platform, you will see results. It is not overnight. None of any, nothing good is ever overnight. You need a strategy, you need amazing content, and you need to engage with the right people. So I just wanna remind you that you're all super, super awesome. We're gonna open it up to Q&A in just a second. I am gonna leave um, my contact information here. I am on Fiverr Pro under this URL. I'm on Instagram, both for myself and for the business. And I do have an Instagram Rockstar Success Book that dials in even more succinctly into how you can create your Instagram strategy, which you know, if you want more advice, I do recommend checking out that URL. So I'm going to um, kick it back to Marcy and Rand to feed me some questions from the Q&A, which I'm very excited to answer. Yeah, thank you very much, Nadia. This was Absolutely. an awesome presentation. I think it was like the context of understanding how Instagram became from a leisure, teenager, youngster kind of uh, app uh, to a business necessity and definitely explain to uh, business owners uh, how to use it properly. Um, so maybe we can uh, read some of the questions. Uh, maybe we can start about the link tree because a lot of people ask about it. Can you explain in further detail what is it and for what uh, it uses, uh, uh, businesses can use it for? Sure, and I probably should have added that in there as a tool, and I'll make a quick edit to the presentation because I know you're going to be sharing it around. But Linktree is essentially a website that allows you to consolidate all of your different links. So for example, for my Linktree, I have um, my alternate media company website. Right now I have the um, Fiverr workshop I'm doing right now. I have my Instagram Rockstar Success Book link. I have a YouTube link. Um, there's a quite a few links there. So it's a good way to aggregate all of your different links. And even if say you have one company site, perhaps you want to push a specific product on that site. Maybe you have, maybe you're a fashion brand and you have a t-shirt that is like limited edition and you want people to grab that, but you also don't want people to not go to the whole site. So on your link tree, you could easily have a link to directly to that product. And then you could have your website and then you can have your other social media channels. It's funny because I actually was somewhat resistant to Linktree at first because I thought it would be really busy and no one would click, but it's crazy. My click-through rate has been like 80% or something like that on Linktree. 
So I highly recommend it. It's also, um, there's a free version, there's a pro version. I have the pro version just so I can have more links, but you can still have quite a few links with the um, non-pro version. Nice, okay. Uh, a question from Jesse. How do you find good hashtags to reach a target audience? Sure, so um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you really want to have a nice breakdown of your hashtags to be 60% audience specific, 20% industry specific, and 20% brand specific. So if you're thinking about reaching your target audience, you almost, you really wanna get into their psychology and think about how these people identify and the types of hashtags that they're using and what they're looking for. So for example, let's say that you are, let me get really specific here, um, an animal hospital in Orange County, California. <laughs> And you want to find um, specifically people that would you would be supporting there. So you're going to look for like, obviously, you're going to want to use some local hashtags because you are a brick and mortar local business. So like Orange County, like pet owner, like OC pets or OC like pet mama, or like OC blog. You can even do like OC like blogger because sometimes a lot of these bloggers or people that use that hashtag that are active on Insta. They might have animals and then they might want to come to you and so there's you want to just think in the cycle like the psychology of it okay um a question from dustin talking about metrics what's the most efficient way to see the metrics of your audience so i mean i always recommend to just keep it sim as simple as possible like if you're going into like looking at your insights in the back end of instagram those are usually the best bet for you um if you're an influencer or like someone that's really trying to build yourself up as a thought leader <clears throat> it's worth running a report on yourself and even as a brand on flannix.com i did leave that as a resource so that way you can really see the breakdown of like where your audience is coming from and their ages genders and all of that okay cool thanks uh a question from donna what uh what if you have more than one niche to cover what do you recommend doing yeah so that is an awesome question you just want to be totally aware of what these multiple niches are but find a way to have an overarching umbrella that kind of consolidates the niches together because chances are if you have one business that covers multiple niches there's still going to be an overarching connection to them if there, say you are like a big operation and you have multiple businesses beneath that operation that happen to be under a different sector each, then it would be recommended to create different accounts for each of those separate businesses. But if you're one business that covers a lot of ground and multiple niches, you just need to understand how each niche might target a different type of consumer, but still how to keep everything brand aligned and somewhat uniform while also being distinct. Okay. Um, a question from Michael. Can you please explain a bit about shout outs? So shout outs. That's a great question. A lot of people who first start working with micro and nano influencers, they want to use shout outs to grow. And that's totally fine. But if you are going to do shout outs, I recommend working with nano and micro influencers who are very much brand aligned and audience aligned like just because somebody might have 15,000 followers if they are a beauty blogger and you are selling like cutlery to like middle-aged women in georgia that's not going to do you any services you know what i mean so you want to be sure that if you're doing a shout out it's strategic um it can be definitely worth it because you that person and their audience are gonna see you and they're gonna to wanna to work with you. I tend to be a little more relational with shout outs. I like to try and facilitate an actual relationship between the person that's doing the shout out um, or even create like an Instagram live situation. So you're having a conversation and then there's a natural reason to do the shout out. So it's less like, oh, this person's getting paid to do a shout out. You want to be strategic. So people think there is a real relationship and ideally you do have a desire to actually foster a relationship. Uh, I have a great question here about influencer marketing. So how do businesses make sure to make the right connections with influencers? 
Yes. So that actually connects back to the last, like, I guess the question before that about niche, you want to be sure that the influencers you're reaching out to are niche specific. You don't want to reach out to influencers that don't connect any way, shape or form to your niche because that's not going to be advantageous to you and your goals. Now, in the beginning, if you don't have a very large budget, you can definitely reach out to nano and micro influencers. They are people that have a smaller following. Typically, a nano influencer has anywhere from like a thousand to 10,000 followers and a micro might have 10,000 to um, like a little over 50K in that range. So you just want to reach out and foster a real relationship with them. I often suggest with influencer marketing, you know, there's a few different types of mar things that you can do. You can do a short term campaign, so you can find a certain number of influencers to work with in a one time campaign. You can do a long term solution, such as creating an ambassador program, so that way you're working with influencers for the long haul. Or you can do the shout out very one time style, but again, it's better that that's like an interview or a feature, something that feels more strategic and less like, oh, I got a shout out because it's not really going to do you any service for brand authority. Okay, since we're running out of time, just uh, another last question that I think is important. Uh, can you explain a bit about the content in relation to stories? Um, and I guess that the question pertains to videos uh versus maybe images what do you think yes for sure i definitely suggest as much as possible to do video for stories because your feed like i was talking about earlier it's best to try and curate your feed in the sense that you've done some planning for how your content's going to be showing up and the types of posts you're making and captions and so on and so forth in that vein doing your stories in kind of a more documentarian approach, like short video, even video you've pre-recorded, but ideally like live time, you and your team, just you, to break it up, break up that curation with something that's more, a little more raw and fresh is amazing. So I definitely suggest if you can have more video in your stories than not, that's ideal, it engages better, um, it has more reach, then that's going to be to your advantage. Great, okay. Uh, Nadia, thank you very, very much again for uh, hosting this webinar. Uh, thank you all for participating. I hope you uh, had fun as much as I do. Uh, and see you in our next webinars. Bye. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day.